Hello, my name is Dr. Rachel Bussman. I'm a clinical psychologist at the Child Mind Institute, and I'm also the past president of the Selective Mutism Association. And we are here to talk about Selective Mutism 101. This webinar is part of a webinar series by the Selective Mutism Association. We want to thank the Macklin Foundation for the generous donation that makes these webinars possible. This is a link to our YouTube channel, which is where this webinar will be, along with other webinars by the Selective Mutism Association board and other invited guests. Our YouTube channel is something that you can search for just by searching the Selective Mutism Association. The content in the following webinar is for informational purposes and not intended to replace therapy. And if you are looking for a treating professional, you can visit our website at Selective Mutism Association to find a list of uh, potential providers in your area. So we're going to go ahead and get started. We will actually um, talk about some Selective Mutism 101 um, content, and then towards the end, we'll be talking about more COVID-specific uh, content, specifically um, how to do exposures and how to continue to make progress in SM treatment in the virtual format. So when we get started, whenever I talk about selective mutism or anxiety, I always back up and talk about fear, because it's important to know that fear is just something we all experience. It's normal to have a fear response in the face of a danger. In fact, it's very adaptive, meaning we survived as a species because we're able to quickly react in the face of a stressor. Usually when that happens, we either go into fight or flight, and we're not even really aware that that's happening. Um, if I was driving my car um, late at night or even during the day and a deer jumped out in front of my car, which does happen where I live, I would quickly slam on the brakes and maybe feel um, a host of physiologic sensations really outside of my awareness. It just happens quickly because I need to be able to react in order to avoid hitting the deer or getting in an accident. So having a fight or flight or sometimes a freeze response is just part of how we respond to stressors. Sometimes when we talk about kids who have anxiety, we might think of them as having a really overactive smoke detector. So meaning, they, maybe a, a child will suspect a threat where there isn't really a threat, or even have an over-exaggerated response to a threat that might be considered more of a, a mild threat. So when we talk about anxiety or we talk about something becoming a disorder, we, we need to look at a few things. So we look at symptoms, and in a minute we're gonna talk about selective mutism symptoms. And so a child, when we're um, diagnosing an anxiety disorder, it's not just one symptom, it's multiple symptoms that are associated with that particular diagnosis. Those symptoms have been present for a certain amount of time. So not just a day, not usually a week, usually multiple weeks and sometimes months. And importantly, um, something is considered a disorder or crossing, crossing this threshold when it interferes with the child's ability to do their job. So for, for us, we think of kids' jobs as having to do with being in a student, being part of a family, having social relationships, and really being, inter being able to interact comfortably across situations. So let's spend a little time talking about what selective mutism is. So it really is a situation or situation where a child is not able to verbalize in some specific social situation despite speaking usually quite fluently at home or in other situations where they're comfortable. Kids with selective mutism are often described as chatterboxes at home, and sometimes parents will, will be quite surprised when hearing that their child might not speak at school because the child is usually speaking a lot at home. We often see impairment in school, during extracurricular activities, play dates with extended family, or all of those things, or just some of those areas. What we do see is an impairment, and we see that the selective mutism is not primarily due to language disorder, or speech or language disorder, and it's not primarily due to a discomfort with the spoken language, meaning that the child um, understands enough of the language that they're, that they're speaking in. We have a duration of at least a month, not including the first month of school, 
And then we do see that some children demonstrate some pretty fluid boundaries in terms of their speaking and others have more rigid boundaries. An example of that would be a child who will continue to speak to the parent while on school grounds, but maybe in a whisper, is considered to still have somewhat of a fluid boundary. Whereas a child who maybe as soon as the door opens in the car, they stop speaking, that might be considered a more rigid boundary. So when we talk about prevalence, it, there's, there's quite a bit of information about this, right? So we see a range for the prevalence between you know, a 0.1 to 1.9% of children and roughly about 1% of, of elementary students. We see a higher prevalence of female to male and we definitely see a, a more prevalent um, representation of children in bilingual families or families speaking multiple languages. And we do see a higher rate of speech and language concerns in um, represented among selective mutism kids or kids who are diagnosed with selective mutism. What I'll say about prevalence, and again, this is, this is I think, a fairly good amount of people feel this way, that sometimes this is very underrepresented or underdiagnosed. I've worked very often with kids who have had other diagnoses first. And so maybe we're captured as a different anxiety disorder, or maybe um, the selective mutism was thought of as um, a language disorder, when in fact it was both selective mutism and a language disorder. So I often wonder if really we would see a little bit of a higher rate um, in, in diagnosis. So I want to spend a good amount of time talking about some common myths or misperceptions related to selective mutism. So the first one is, isn't necessarily a myth, but it is true that selective mutism used to be called elective mutism. That was the disorder's name before the most recent updated version of our large manual that we use for uh, diagnosis. And elective mutism, I think, really often connotes willfulness. And so I think that has really given selective mutism a bad reputation as being thought of as something a child can control or something that they're um, doing to somehow assert defiance or willfulness. And what we really know for sure is that selective mutism is an anxiety disorder, not a disorder of willfulness or defiance. The other sometimes myth or misperception is that social anxiety disorder or social phobia and SM are one in the same. And what I will say is while the most commonly diagnosed disorder along with selective mutism is social phobia or social anxiety disorder, they're not exactly the same. Social anxiety disorder or social phobia has to do with um, a fear of being criticized or negatively evaluated, perhaps in the speaking realm, but also could be concerns about having your work shown or being observed to perform in some way, and maybe in a way that has nothing to do with speaking. Um, and so while we do see some children as having both, we certainly do see kids who, except for the speaking, so except for the SM, might be quite um, outgoing, perform, raise their hand, um, get up in front of people. That wouldn't be a kid that has social anxiety as well. Another misperception is that something must have happened to the child to make them stop talking. Like perhaps a trauma happened that traumatized them and made it so that they wouldn't speak anymore. And so I think this is a pretty misleading um, thought. And while certainly any child can ex experience a trauma and could develop post-traumatic stress disorder, um, really the trajectory or the constellation of symptoms that go with trauma really are very different from selective mutism. Now, children who've gone through a trauma, like being in a terrible accident or suffering abuse, might have difficulty speaking about things associated with that trauma, but they usually don't present in the same way as we see kids with selective mutism in the more classic sense. We also see, very unfortunately, that sometimes very well-intended people, like teachers or pediatricians might say, oh, Johnny, he's just shy, or oh, he's a boy, boys talk later, he'll outgrow it. And while we definitely see children who are shy warm up over situations, children with selective mutism aren't just shy. It's, 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 not, it's, it's a misperception to call it that. And kids that do not get treated for any anxiety disorder, it really tends to have a, a worsening course over time rather than just outgrowing it. And then the last set of 
of things um, on the bottom of this slide, autism, cognitive deficits, and language disorders, we do see a bunch of kids have a diagnosis of autism. And we do, it's not unfathomable um, to see children with both autism and SM. However, when you see a child who is not really speaking, isn't engaging with their peers, maybe has a flat affect, meaning not showing a lot of facial expression, that can sometimes get misdiagnosed as autism when in fact it's selective mutism. So we have to be really careful and appreciate other factors like obtaining a really good developmental history and getting a variety of sources of information to either support that there's a developmental disorder or not. And then I will also just say it's very hard to test a child, test their IQ, test their speech language abilities when they're not yet speaking. And so often if there are academic concerns or concerns having to do with um, social pragmatic language or other areas of language disorders or articulation, a child really needs to be able to speak and participate in that testing. You can't only use nonverbal measures of evaluation. Okay. So what I will say is that SM is a product of nature and nurture. And what we mean is this, there's a bit of genetics and there's a bit of family history that goes into this um, diagnosis. And that, that diagnosis is, is based on both genetics and how the environment interacts with the child. And so this is, this is pretty important. I'm not saying that it's nurture in that how the child's taken care of, but that there may be a child with some vulnerability biologically for an anxiety disorder. But most importantly is how the environment interacts with the child to actually shape and maintain SM. So what I'll also say is this circle is really important. If we go through and, and give a couple of examples, it will be quite clear how we could see SM being maintained. Now, this is not to blame the environment for how we interact with kids. It's normal that we interact in the way that we do, and it's very um, natural to want to help a child who's in distress. But let's say we have a child named Jackson, and someone at the grocery store says, Jackson, um, I recognize you from my son's class. What's your name? Likely the child will experience some level of distress and maybe he looks away, maybe he grabs mom's hand, maybe he just smiles. And usually the environment, so meaning the person who asked the question and the parent or caregiver probably sees Jackson's inhibition or his um, sort of reticence. And then something happens. So maybe the person who asked the question says, oh wait, um, I remember your, your name is Jackson, or oh, you must be shy, you don't have to answer my question. Or the parent might say, oh yes, his name is Jackson, he was in your son's class last year. But usually what happens is the moment passes and the expectation to speak is, is removed. And everybody sort of feels relief. Now they might not all say, oh, and experience relief in a very obvious way, but in that very momentary interaction, something really powerful happens, which is called negative reinforcement, which is just a fancy way of saying that the, the, the thing that was very uncomfortable, that, that pressure has been removed and that creates this feeling of relief, so to speak. And we're all sort of motivated to stay away from things that feel bad. And so that, um, interaction of being asked a question, not answering, and sort of the pressure being lifted is reinforced. And imagine um, a child being asked multiple questions a day, maybe even hundreds, and not being able to answer. So we're going to move into talking a little bit about treatment. And we'll talk briefly. This is a lot of information on this slide. And if you're interested, I'm, I'm sure we can find um, links to these articles or you can find um, the articles yourself in terms of what the evidence tells us. So when we talk about evidence, we talk about randomized controlled trials, so RCTs. That's just a really fancy way of saying um, an experiment where there are aspects of the research that are blind, blinded, meaning the, the the people who are doing the research don't know which treatment group the patients are in, so as to keep it as unbiased as possible. And oftentimes there are multiple people who are part of the study so that the people who are delivering the treatment don't know which 
which um, sort of arm of the research the child is in. So there are lots of controls in the research to make sure that it's as unbiased as possible. So these are several um, research studies that are pretty recent. Several of them are actually follow up to original studies. And then some newer studies, so Carpenter et al. really, um, that's where Dr. Kurtz and colleagues um, developed the adaptation for PCIT for SM, which is what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the time. Cornacchio was the first randomized control trial for group-based intensives for SM using that PCIT SM model. And Catchpole et al. very recently had the first waitlist controlled trial of PCIT SM. So, we are talking about evidence-based treatment, and for the rest of this talk, I will be focusing on PCIT-SM. So when we talk about treatment and the goals of treatment for behavioral interventions for SM, we want to do a couple of things. We want to increase parent skills, right? And even when the child is older, we still want to increase parent skills. So for younger children, it's, it's reasonable to think that a three or four year old, you don't just interact as the clinician with the child alone, right? Parents are very much part of the process. But for SM specifically, and in PCITSM, we're really involving the parents because the parents become extensions of the clinician, so to speak. So we want to skill up the caregivers. We want to increase the number of people, places, and activities in which the child is speaking. And when I say child, I mean child of any age. Generalized is so important, and actually general, generalization is sometimes missing from other treatments, and it's really a very key piece of treatment that involves exposure, and generalizing is very important in anxiety treatment. It means not just seeing the, the gains or the speaking with one person, but we see it across other situations and with other people as well. And we're also wanting to build the stress tolerance for the child and the parent and other adults, meaning help everyone feel a bit comfortable being uncomfortable, again, as my close friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Kurt says. So really being able to sit with discomfort and being able to tolerate a bit of discomfort in the service of the game. So I wanna spend just a moment on, on medication. This isn't really primarily a talk on medication, but I will say that there are a couple things to think about. We want to look at large multi-site studies to provide information about medication and its efficacy. So CAM and the follow-up study CAMEL is a large scale study following kids across multiple years, getting CBT, so cognitive behavioral therapy, medication, or combined. On Kurt's psychology website, there is an excellent fact sheet that has really excellent information about medication. And it's, I like it a lot because it's very user-friendly, meaning it's not very technical, but it's technical enough to provide evidence and information, but readable for the user. So I've, I've left that, uh, that link there. So the takeaways are when done well, a combination of behavioral treatment and medication is very effective and possibly more effective than, a, than just treatment alone. But there are some things we think about when we're discussing or deciding when to recommend medication or not. So some of the times that we opt to start with treatment only, so being behavioral treatment or PCITSM only, is maybe a history of no behavioral therapy in the past. Um, low comorbidities, meaning there aren't other co-occurring disorders that might add to the level of impairment for the child. Maybe there isn't a very strong family history for anxiety. And maybe the child is starting treatment and really meeting those benchmarks um, in terms of um, quickly talking to the parent alone in a room and starting to see gains in, you know, small and incremental steps during a fade-in, for example, or a parent using the skills in other situations. When we think about more severe impairment and times that we actually will make a recommendation for medication and sometimes out of the gate in combination with treatment, would be a prior history of behavioral therapy that really was either very slow to make gains or even despite everyone's best efforts, the child's effort, the parent's effort, and the therapist's effort, there really were not gains being made. 
high comorbidities. So maybe the child has selective mutism and social anxiety or some obsessive compulsive traits or separation anxiety or really disruptive or dysregulated behavior, a strong family history. And then maybe even after a couple of weeks or a month of treatment that is robust treatment, the child just really isn't making gains as quickly as we'd like to see them. So now we're gonna go into PCITSM in a little bit more depth. So what we're talking about is an adaptation of parent-child interaction therapy. And I really invite you to go to the uh, PCIT.org, which is the National um, PCIT Foundation. There's a lot of really great um, articles on there. There are some clips and videos to really explain PCIT. PCIT is a very well-researched treatment protocol and has been adapted for a variety of disorders, including, as I mentioned before, the 2014 adaptation for SM. And so it's a treatment that we're going to talk about in a minute that in heavily involves caregivers and also heavily involves psychoeducation. The treatment is very transparent and collaborative and often involves school and other people that are in the child's life. So it does not happen in a vacuum. So we're gonna talk briefly about some of the skills. So hopefully after watching this webinar, you can go home and try some of them. So what we're really talking about on the left are the skills we use, the skills we teach in PCITSM. And you use those skills to do the stuff on the right. So that's why you see the arrow going over here. So I know it's a lot of technical terms, but we're gonna go over it in the next several minutes. So what we're talking about are is two sets of skills that we use in order to be skillful as we do something called a fade in and as we do exposures. So meaning we want to use the best um, set of skills to set the child up for success and to set the parent up to feel successful. So I'm not gonna go back to the slide, but in the slide where we talk about that circle, of negative reinforcement, we really want to avoid giving the child more practice in being nonverbal. So we want to teach the parents lots of skills and help them use those skills in a variety of situations. So we're going to talk about CDI and VDI now. So when we talk about CDI, you can remember CDI C for child, meaning we're really following the child's lead. This might feel a lot like play therapy because it very much is based in that. It's all about um, building rapport with the child, connecting with your child. This is what a therapist who is trained in PCITSM as they're fading in with your child, you would hear a lot of these skills being used. The hallmark of this is building comfort and avoiding questions. And so you will see this acronym PRIDE, and we'll talk about it as we go along. These are some of the do skills. So these are the things you want to be doing during CDI. P for praise. The best kind of praise is the labeled praise. So meaning, and not just for verbalization, but what we know from PCIT in its original form is that if your child does something that you want to reinforce and see more of, the best thing to do is to praise it in a specific way right after you see the behavior. So let's say your child takes a cup and they put it down in front of their plate and you say, great, putting your cup where it belongs, that's a praise for a specific behavior. If you just said good job, your child wouldn't really know what you were saying good job for. So when we're talking about using labeled praise for speaking, we're talking about saying things like, thanks for telling me, great answering my question, I love hearing your voice, great brave talking. Those are all labeled praises. Similarly, reflections serve to also reinforce speech or reinforce talking. So after your child says something, you might label praises. So they, they, your child says, I like blue, and you say, thanks for telling me. That's a labeled phrase. Or your child says, I like blue, and you say, you like blue, or you do like blue. Those are reflections. You'll notice in my voice that my intonation stays sort of flat as a statement. And it's just repeating what your child says. The other really great reason why reflections are good is that if you're in a situation where your child, let's say, is next to you and someone's sitting over there and your child whispers to you, I like blue, and you say, oh, you like blue, 
in sort of a regular tone of voice, someone sitting over there actually has the benefit of hearing your child. That's very different than you saying, oh, I want to let you know that Johnny likes blue. So it's important when we move forward that when your child is speaking, one of the first things you want to do in CDI is either praise or reflect. So again, praise is a thank you for something specific and a reflection is repeating. Imitate and enjoy just really mean that when you're interacting with your child and you're in CDI, you're practicing CDI or you're using it thoughtfully, you're attending to what your child's doing. So if they're coloring, you're, you're enjoying it by looking and making comments and maybe you're imitating by saying, I like what you're doing, I'm gonna color too. It doesn't mean that you have to actually repeat or copy what they do, it means that you're very invested in the interaction. Describing or behavior description is really sounds like a sportcaster. It's a play-by-play -play sort of joining your child in their play or what they're doing in a way that narrates and it lets them know you're following their lead, but it also is very useful if your child is not yet speaking because it allows you to interact with them without asking questions. Because in a minute, we'll go over the don't skills. And in CDI, you're not asking questions. So what it is, is a very specific sentence that describes exactly what your child's doing. So you're picking up a purple marker. And now I see your coloring on the paper. And now you're making a purple square. Now it might sound a little awkward, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But it's making no assumptions about what your child is doing, and it's just incrementing, incrementally sort of laying out what they're doing. Now, you can make it a little less awkward and make it sound a little more natural by interspersing some of your own comments in there. So, for example, your child maybe is drawing or coloring, and you could say, I see you're picking up a purple pen, and now you're drawing a, a purple heart. That looks like a lot of fun. I'm going to go ahead and do that, too, because I really like drawing shapes. Oh, I see you added another purple shape. That looks like a square. I'm, well, you have the purple marker, so I'm going to use my black pen over here. You might hear in my language that it's not only descriptions, but I'm also adding other things in there, too. Now, the don't. We don't want to prompt for any questions, meaning in CDI, we're not asking questions. We're building comfort. We're kind of getting ready for the prompting part. And we have to do that by building comfort. So we're not giving a child a command to speak or asking them questions. And it's hard to do that. You'll realize when you start to practice, it's a little tricky. Another thing we don't want to do is use a lot of criticism, right? So maybe your child is drawing and they count their squares and they miscount. So they do one, two, four. The thing you would want to do is say, great counting, one, two, three. So you can correct but gently. It's not a time to say, that's not what comes after two, three comes after two. So it, it, we wanna watch our criticizing and sarcasm for sure. And then mind reading, which is, is tricky. So if I said, if I was interacting with you in real life, I would do this, but on the webinar I can too. If your child was pointing to this container with water in it, you might assume and perhaps accurately that they want water. Similarly, if they were drawing in rainbow colors, you might assume they're drawing a rainbow. But what we actually want to do is simply describe behaviors and leave it as an opportunity to speak. And the reason why we want to do this is if we mind read, we actually deprive the child of an opportunity to talk. And we actually want to make an opening for them to speak rather than mind reading. So you want to get kind of used to describing behaviors. I see you pointing you're pointing at the container rather than, oh, you're pointing, you must want water. So here's a little bit of what CDI might sound like. So here's a child and parent playing Legos. And the parent says, Legos are so much fun. I love playing with you. I see you're putting some blue pieces on top of a base. Behavior description is that last sentence. Child building, I'm making a swimming pool. A pool, reflection. That's a great idea you have for a hot day. I can hand you some more pieces. I don't need those, the child says. Thanks for letting me know, labeled praise. I'm gonna use them for my pool. What are you making? Good question. I'm making a pool too. I see you're adding something to your pool. It's a diving board. 
diving board, which is a reflection. Why don't we have a pool? That's a good question. Pools are really fun. We go to the town pool, which is close to our house and fun to see friends. Oh, I see you're adding some people there. So as you read this along, you can see and hear some of the CDI skills. And you don't see a parent asking any questions. You do see the child asking questions. And it's a reminder that if your child asks a question, if we remember that the first thing we wanna do is reflect or, or labeled praise of verbalization, one thing we can do when our child asks us a question is say, great question, or thanks for asking me, and then answer the question. So CDI sounds weird. I don't usually talk like this. So this is my um, definitely my acknowledgement of it absolutely is a new way of interacting. And it requires practice on the part of the caregiver. So meaning if you only plan to use the CDI skills, when you go out and about with your child, you are not gonna feel well equipped. It's kind of like learning a new language. So we really need practice in saying CDI skills. We want practice for the child in hearing it. And we just wanna be transparent. So sometimes, many kids don't say anything, but some kids actually will say, why are you talking to me like that? Or you're talking to me funny, or why are you talking to me the way that this therapist talks? And actually, you can say something like, that's a really good question, or great noticing. This is how I learn how to practice brave talking also. So it actually allows you to act, it allows you to give information to your child, but also this is all about the stress tolerance in a way of just tolerating doing something new and doing something in a new way. And most children, if not all, get used to it. I will say it is important to modify skills with older, older children. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because I know that there have been other webinars that really address this well. And I would, I would definitely send you to um, our YouTube channel to watch that. But one of the things that just comes up for me is the level of enthusiasm we use with an older kid really needs to be toned down. So for example, saying, thanks for telling me that to a 12 year old is going to sound very patronizing. And so we wanna be a little bit more casual. You might just use a reflection. So maybe your teenage or your tween says, I wanna go get um, you know, a smoothie. And you say, a smoothie, that sounds like a good idea in a much more casual way rather than thanks for telling me. I also think that we tend to describe behaviors less because they can get very annoying. So saying to a 12 year old, I see your um, looking at all the smoothie choices, and now you're pointing to a specific picture on the menu, you might just say what you're doing. So make some comments. These smoothies look really great. I'm going to take a look and see what kinds there are. Oh, it looks like you're looking too. So we'll have to figure this out together. So being a little bit more casual, but I would definitely refer you to the tween and teen skills that were covered in um, one of our other webinars. Okay. VDI. So we only have CDI. Now we have VDI, V for verbal. So these are our prompting skills. And our prompting is planful and intentional. Now it doesn't mean we make a, a huge plan around every question, but it means that we have made a decision to make um, an overture with a question. So it's something that happens gradually and it's considered an exposure practice. And VDI always follows warm up. So it's never used alone. So when, for example, when I'm working with kids and they've talked to me many times, I still would never go out to the waiting room and say, Susie, how was your weekend? What did you do this weekend? How are things going? That would be way too many questions for a kiddo with SM, even if they talked to me before. So I still probably would go outside and say, it's so nice to see you, Susie. I really love those awesome sneakers. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I have some games set up for us. None of those things involve questions. So it is planful and it's intentional, but it's also focused on using a certain type of prompt and not using other types of prompts. So I'll start with the types of prompts we don't use. So there's nothing wrong inherently with yes, no questions. However, yes, no questions for a kiddo with SM often leads to head nodding. So for example, if I said to Jackson, do you like chocolate ice cream? He might be very used to doing this 
and having someone say, oh yeah, you do like chocolate ice cream. I like chocolate ice cream so much too. So what we tend to do in PCA TSM is really avoid yes, no questions. And you'll probably know when you've asked one because you'll either see a nod or a shaking of the head or a pointing. I'm gonna skip direct commands for a minute and really go over to the green, the green lighted question. We use a lot of forced choice questions. Do you like chocolate, vanilla or something else? Um, are you playing with Legos, Zingo or something else? And open-ended questions are also helpful, but we tend to start with those forced choice questions. Why we have something else on there is really more to give the opportunity to sort of encompass all available choices. So we have some kids that if you said, do you like chocolate or vanilla? Best. The child might say chocolate, and then we could say, thanks for telling me chocolate. We have some kids that can have trouble sort of asserting preferences or saying if, if they weren't given the particular option. And so maybe they like pistachio and you say, do you like chocolate, vanilla, chocolate or vanilla best? And they say nothing. It could be because you haven't given them the option that they would choose. So we try to get as many available options sort of covered in our four choice question. Now it would be reasonable if you said, you know, do you have a favorite flavor of ice cream or you don't have a favorite flavor of ice cream, which is making a yes, no question into a forced choice. And the child says, yes. And you would say, yes, thanks for telling me you do. What is your favorite flavor? So it would be reasonable to ask an open-ended question rather than say, do you like chocolate, vanilla or something else? And then they say something else. Oh, great telling me, do you like strawberry, pistachio or something else? You could be in the something else all day. So it's okay to ask an open-ended question, especially when you're led in that direction. But we tend to use forced choice first. So here are the sequences. And what I'll say is this. Asking a good prompting question doesn't mean that the child is definitely going to answer. What it means is when you are using good VDI skills, it means that no matter what happens, you as the but let's say caregiver knows exactly what to do no matter what kind of response you get. So that's really the important part is this doesn't mean that your child is definitely going to answer, but you're trying to increase the likelihood and you know exactly what you are going to do no matter what. So let's say I'm getting ready to do some drawing with my, my, uh, my friend, I'm trying to get us some choices and I say, you know, we're gonna draw right now. Would you like to use the purple marker, the black marker or something else? And then I wait. So a prompt starts with a question and a waiting. And I'm gonna model what that sounds like. Do you wanna use purple, black or something else? It's a pretty long time. And usually after a couple of seconds, people can feel a little bit impatient or uncomfortable, but that wait time is really important. So. Let's say your child says purple. No matter how loud it is, they say purple. You would want to reflect or print label praise and maybe use a check mark, even though we're not talking about this quite yet. But if you're using reinforcement, the best way to end that sequence would be to reflect or praise or both and use a check. So do you want purple, black or something else? Purple. Thanks for telling me purple or purple. So that's the easiest sequence is you ask, you wait five seconds, the child answers, and you end the sequence by using a labeled praise or a reflection or both and a check mark if you're hopefully using some reinforcement. Let's go to nonverbal. I have some markers. Do you want purple, black or something else? So let's say after a couple seconds, the child points. And you know what they're pointing to because they're pointing to the black mark. So you can actually right away describe what they're doing and know in your mind that you get one more chance to ask this question. And so you either want to jazz up that question in some way or maybe increase the likelihood that they're gonna answer by perhaps reminding them that they're earning brave talking check marks or they're working on brave talking and they only have one or two questions left until they earn a prize. So it might sound like this. Um, Jackson, it's time to pick a marker. Do you want red or uh, purple or black or something else? 
I see you pointing. And I know that you really like a bunch of different pens. I really like the purple one. And I just want to remind you, you actually have earned already two checks. So, so for your next check, did you want black or something else? So what you're doing is you're acknowledging the pointing. And then you're trying to shift that to a verbal response. And you would ask one more time, wait. And if the child answers, you say, well, thanks for telling me. Or we'll come back to that question. And then you go back into CDI. So what it means is if you've asked the question twice and you haven't gotten a response, we don't want to give the child more practice not answering. So we will say we'll come back to that. Now, when we say we'll come back to that, does it mean we'll come back to the exact question? We might. Or we might go back into CDI and say, we'll come back to that later. I'm going to give you a pen here. I'm going to keep drawing on this page. Oh, I see you picked up a black pen and now you're scribbling on the paper. And then maybe in a minute or so, you might ask another question. Will it be the same question you did before? Maybe. Or it might just be a different question. But the idea is we'll come back to talking. And the same thing happens if you get no response. So a nonverbal response means a shrug, a point, a head nod. No response literally means no response. So you still want to wait the five seconds, which can be quite hard. You want to, in the moment, assess if there's something that you're missing. So for example, maybe there are a lot of choices of markers and the child's having trouble deciding. Maybe the second time you ask, you might say, I have a lot of markers. Do you want purple, black, red, or you're not sure? So maybe you add, maybe they don't know as an option. If they said, I don't know, you'd say, oh, you don't know, thanks for telling me. You know, it's sometimes hard to make decisions, but. I'll put a bunch of choices here and you can go ahead and take what you like. But if you get no response the second time, the same thing, you want to say, we'll come back to that question and go back to CDI. And in your mind, you want to assess maybe there were some reasons why there was a nonverbal or, or a no response. Perhaps you were talking with your child outside of a classroom or in a park and some people walked by right at that moment. Or maybe you're on a video call with grandma and your child hasn't yet spoken to grandma on the screen. So you want to assess the reason for the response, not response, or nonverbal response. OK, so here's what CDI and VDI might sound like together. And I've chosen an older child just to, to frame that. So they're playing a game called Five Second Rule, which is actually a fun game. So parent says, I'm so glad you taught me how to play Five Second Rule. And the kid says, yes, yeah, fun. It is fun. I don't remember if we used the timer last time. I don't like the timer. Oh, thanks for letting me know. Labeled phrase. That's fine. Can I go first? Thanks for asking. Sure. The child picks the card. This is name three things you do in the summer. Oh, in the summer. You said you want to start. So what's one thing you do in the summer? So that's an open-ended question. This is so easy. Swim and eat ice cream. Swim and eat ice cream are two summer things. So that's a reflection. Did you pick a third or you're not sure? That's a forced choice question. The child nods. You're nodding. Yes or not yet? Yes. Have no bedtime. You said a really creative one. Yeah, we do get pretty loose with bedtime in the summer. So this is a, another example of how you would use forced choice questions, open-ended, and also wait. OK. So we talked about this a little bit already, but the thing to do when you get a verbal response, regardless of volume, is label praise, reflect, and a check mark if you're using reinforcement. So for younger kids, it might literally be a piece of paper with some check boxes. I especially do this with my telehealth appointments, and it might actually be, um, you know, what are you going to do later today? Go swimming. Thanks for telling me. And you get a check mark for answering my question, and you keep doing check marks. What do check marks mean? Well, it might mean picking a prize at home. It might mean a special privilege like 15 extra minutes on an iPad or pick a special snack or be in charge of movie night or play a board game with mom alone. The idea of what's important to a child is the thing that's best for reinforcement. We don't want expensive things necessarily, small and sustainable rather than big. For older kids, sometimes kids are very motivated by something that is a little bit bigger. And so maybe using um, 
check marks to earn points towards the prize. But the idea here is that we want to actually reinforce as much language as possible with a praise and a reflection. Or want, it doesn't matter which you do, but you want to do something first as soon as they finish speaking. So here's just a couple of examples of a bravery sheet. You'll notice that mine for my bravery sheet has a star, oops, has a star on the second row and the, and the third row. And that's actually to show that a lot of times in the beginning, we're not um, expecting the child to earn the whole page, but especially in sessions, we'll often say, when you get to the end of the row, you're gonna get to pick your first prize. Or when you get to the end of the second row, you're gonna get your first prize. On the bottom, I put this website, kidpoints.com. It's actually a great website for free and customizable charts that can be printed um, and used for a variety of things, including putting some brave talking um, goals on there also. This is an example of a higher order goal sheet we use. So we, while we do not start with things like raising hand or using eye contact or asking others questions, sometimes your child will at, be at a point where they need to be working on higher level goals. And so here's an example of one we've used in our group when we have kids working on higher level goals. So for homework for parents and caregivers, we're also often asking to practice five minutes a day of CDI and VDI, first at home, and then select planned and intentional situations to do that practice. Why? As, we, as I said before, we want you to become as familiar and fluent in the skills as possible. And we want the child to view skills as a daily part of life and not just something they, that they hear the parent use when they go somewhere. And that's gonna become, if you think about it, and I use this example for myself, I speak a little bit of French and not very well, but if I wanted to brush up on my French before, let's say going on a trip to France, the ideal would be to be practicing a little bit every day, not just using it in the situation at the moment I need the language because that will be higher stress, I won't be as practiced, and I won't feel as comfortable. And we want the child to hear this as just the way we talk as we're practicing brave talk. Okay, so now we're back to the what we do with the skills. So a fade in is the process of transferring speech from one person to another. So it could be transferring speech from the caregiver to a therapist or a caregiver to a teacher, or it could be from last year's teacher to the new teacher. But regardless, it means process is the transferring speech from someone the child already talks to, to a new person. Now this can be done sometimes quickly over one or two practices, and sometimes has to be done very incrementally, as in very slowly. And really how long that takes is, is not easy to predict, but it's something that you usually get a sense of once you start doing fade-in, what your child's template is. So you have to ask yourself, do I need one? So let's say your child already talks to their aunt and uncle that they don't see so much, but they do talk to them, then you might not need a fade-in. You might just need practice talking versus someone that they have never spoken to before, like a particular teacher or a peer. And you wanna ask yourself, where was my last place of success in my child speaking to that particular person? So maybe it's a peer where they talk in front of them, but they haven't yet talked to them. That gives you a good sense of where you're gonna start that fade in. So meaning you might start a fade in with a peer that they've spoken in front of, but not to, by having a play date and having the other child and maybe their parents start several feet away so you can help your child talk to you first. You know the fade-in is done when the fade-in sticks, meaning you've transferred speech and the speech stays with the other person. It can't just be that you have one time where your child answers one question from another person and you leave and you assume it's going to continue. You have to make sure it does continue. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So a fade-in always starts with a caregiver or a person that the child already talks to establishing that there's some consistency in speech. How much consistency, I can't really say, but we would want to say in a situation where the child is answering, let's say the parent, at least five to eight questions first before we move the new person closer. And again, 
a fast fade-in might involve a person coming in and saying, oh, it's so nice to see you guys. I can't wait to play. I'm going to sit over there and do some work. That might be the first step to the fade-in. Or for a much slower fade-in, it might be someone coming to a door and saying, oh, guys, it's so nice to see you. Um, I'm glad you're here. I have to go get something, and I'll be back in a little bit. And they actually just leave the door cracked open. So the focus is on verbalizing first. So meaning we want the child consistently answering the parent, but if their volume is lower or if they're only using one word and they're not really using eye contact, that stuff comes later. We want to establish rewards and ideally ahead of time. So meaning maybe you take your brave talking sheet with you, but you've already discussed with your child, hey Jackson, um, I know that you were really working on getting some mini figures for your Lego set. And he already picked some minifigures that he wanted to get and I actually even got one minifigure and it's in the car. That's going to be his reward after we work with his new teacher or have a play date with a new friend virtually or in person for that particular day. And there are many steps in sort of the fade in process. The first step after establishing your child speak is to have that new person enter the situation but with some amount of distance. It could be with them in the hall, it could be with them on the other side of the room, it could be with them five feet away outside, but we want to consider as many little mini steps as possible. Here's an example of a fade in for a classroom, and this could absolutely, the term classroom could be substituted with a lot of other words like peer fade in at the park, or peer fade in at someone's house, or it could be classroom fade in virtually. I have an example of a virtual fade in later, but you see the steps that the parent and child may be playing in an empty classroom or play on the playground alone and establish speech. Then, as I said before, the teacher might enter the room or the area and really avoids engaging while the parent is continuing to use CDI and then VDI skills. So the teacher would wanna enter or the new person would want to enter and acknowledge the child like it's so good to see you guys i have to do some work over here which establishes that i'm here but i'm not putting the pressure on i'm not prompting you yet when it's time to fade in this is where um, you might see a lot of variation so the fade in might end just depending on the severity of the sm it might be that the goal that day is to have the teacher get about an arm's length or two arms lengths away and the parent is continuing to prompt their child and when the child is answering the parent's question the teacher saying something like great answer great telling us and maybe they're the one giving the check mark for some kids with a, a severe presentation that might be a great first step for another child it might be that the the teacher starts to comment on what the child's doing like oh i see you're putting you know some tiles on your um, your structure that you're making, and maybe actually the teacher asks the fourth choice question. An in-between step might be to do something using like a, a command to talk, where the teacher might say, oh, I see you have so many tall Legos, and it looks like you're adding another one. Tell mom if you're going to add a blue or a red one or something else. So sometimes kids need that little mini step of having the new person say, tell mom or tell dad. But the idea would be you continue at the step you're at until you have some consistent success, not paying attention to volume or eye contact. And then if the child's answering the teacher, which would be awesome, or the new person, then the caregiver wants to start to fade their attention. Maybe the parent says, Mrs. Smith, it would be great if you could keep giving the check marks because, oh, I have a phone call. And maybe the parent goes on their phone and looks at something which sounds like, isn't that being a bad parent? It's not when you're trying to get the child to be more interested and more involved in the interaction with the new person. So how do I know if it sticks? So you'll see the, the, side, the slide is very similar on the left and the right. Whether you're in person or virtual, you want to start to fade your attention, possibly leave the room or the area you're working, and make sure that the other person is still being able to get successful verbalization. Now this definitely supposes, supposes that the school or new people have some level of knowledge of what they should be doing during a fade-in, but hopefully the caregiver or the treatment provider has 
has given some information of what the new person should do in terms of at first you want to describe what the child is doing and use phrases then you want to ask a forced choice question so often parents will give like a little cheat sheet for the new person to know how to prompt and how to keep the talking going okay now we're going to talk about exposures so exposures are really being in planful situations or choosing situations where you're purposely going to prompt your child or have situations where someone else might be prompting your child in kind of a plan in a planful way so it's not going to a store and just deciding on that particular day you're going to tell your child go ahead and order that to me would just be deciding in that moment to try something that may or may not work the idea is to do things planfully and and in an incremental way so before you want to have your child being prompted to ask a question or answer a question from someone else you want them to be answering you consistently in all of these different places where can you do exposures pretty much anywhere and what can you do lots of things you can prompt your child to engage in an activity come over and look at the counter and see all the different cookies they have you can say tell me um, there are so many cookies here there's sprinkles black and white chocolate filled jelly filled do you want a chocolate cookie or a different kind of cookie? And you can praise talking in front of other people. So that's often a place to start. You might be thinking, well, my child actually does talk to me at the bakery counter at the store. But, and I would say that's amazing. And the first thing you could be doing is say, thanks for telling me at the counter, which is probably something you maybe don't say so often. You can prompt your child to tell other people great telling me one more time a little louder chocolate or a black and white cookie you can actually give a piece of paper to a clerk that says we're practicing talking do you mind asking this question to my child do you want chocolate vanilla or something else and then one of the later things is you might tell your child ask the baker if they have black and white cookies today the goals of exposures are to get practice approaching rather than avoiding situations. And we want to choose things that are probably just slightly beyond your child's ability. So if your child has never spoken to you at a grocery store, you're not going to have them ask a clerk a question. The first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is have them practice talking to you consistently in a store. If your child has answered your question in the store but never at the counter, that's gonna be the thing you want to do. And you wanna to do tons of washing and rinsing and repeating, meaning we do exposures a lot. As Dr. Kurtz often says, we wanna live an exposure lifestyle. Play dates similarly, whether it's virtual or in person, we consider consistent play dates or interactions with peers as a prescription. And so we want to begin with kids that the child's most comfortable with or has maybe emerging speech and then move to less familiar peers and then later try groups but first it's really quite planful and if we went back in the slides to the fade in you could substitute a peer for this and if you're wondering can that be done with another child when the child i can't control the other child's talking the answer is good question and yes so these skills are great for all kids so yes a parent needs to be quite involved in a play date especially for younger kids or especially when you're trying to prompt speech, but you could have a play date and dedicate 20 or 30 minutes to something that's structured, that maybe is baking or maybe is doing a, um, a craft that requires steps. And you actually can practice asking questions to the other child as well. So here's some sample activities like painting birdhouses. So the parent says, Mia, do you wanna use red or green first? And Mia says red. Thanks for telling us red. James, tell Mia if red is your favorite color or you like something else. Green's my favorite color. Oh, thanks. thank you for telling Mia your favorite color. And so the idea is that it often requires a lot of parent involvement, but it's not bad for other kids to hear this type of language. And in fact, it can help structure play dates. Okay, so that's sort of the end of SM 101. But I wanted to add, um, telehealth in the virtual environment, because a lot of people are probably wondering, 
we're not talking about the elephant in the room. And to me, the elephant in the room is that we're in the middle of a pandemic. And SM by nature is a disorder where children are very much comfortable speaking at home. And so for many families we work with, we've heard often that parents feel frustrated or feel like they're not sure how to keep progress going when there are limitations to being able to being out of the home or even being in school. So here are some of the big questions that we've often been asked. Can my child still work on SM while we're distant? How do we do treatment? How are we going to navigate or manage a new learning landscape? How do I advocate for my child at school? How can I help my child while there are pandemic related restrictions? And I would say each of these questions we could spend an entire webinar on, but I want to leave this webinar by answering some of them. So can we work on speaking goals while distant? The short answer is absolutely yes. Um, there are lots of things you can be doing even if you are socially distant or even if you're not leaving the home in the same way you were before. So maybe you were working on play dates before and that was really the goal you were setting for yourself and your child and maybe in your treatment and that's just not possible right now. But doing some virtual fade ins with extended family or virtual um, video play dates, are they the same? No, but they still offer, offer an opportunity, a chance for practice, especially since during the last six or eight months and probably in the foreseeable future, your child will have interacted virtually in some way. And we know that our kids actually can struggle on camera. Anecdotally, we also have seen kids make wonderful gains because they are usually quite comfortable speaking at home and often parents are in an excellent place to help um, sort of bridge the speaking gap to someone on the other side of the camera. So this is a very wordy slide, but it's just to say that there's a lot of evidence to say that telehealth is effective. There is, while we don't have specific studies or randomized, randomized controlled trials just on SM and telehealth, we do have information that PCIT it delivered in an internet format is effective. And there's lots of reasons to think that telehealth for SM can be effective. So there are lots of, there is actually an evidence base that pre-existed COVID that has been looking at telehealth. And so I want to just say that, it, that to me and to a lot of providers who do SM work, this is not a time to just pause. It's really important that this is probably a time where practicing distress tolerance is even more important. So maybe you're, you're experiencing that your child is making progress and then the pandemic hit. And now the, the fear is that they're regressing or they're not making further progress. So it is a time to practice patience while acclimating your child to a virtual space or active acclimating your child to the same things that we acclimate any child or adult to during this time, which is just different. We want to, you can practice with those who live in the home. So even if just getting on a, a camera or on a FaceTime call or a Zoom call is hard, you can practice that just within your home. Have someone on their phone and someone on a computer and just practice this just for good practice in the house, even before you go to the camera in a real-time play date or Zoom with a teacher. So you can practice video calls with someone your child already speaks to. So for example, maybe grandma or uncle Andy is in another town and your child actually comfortably talks to him or her, but getting on a video call would be great practice just to get comfortable having these kinds of calls as something we do. Working on fade-ins over the screen, definitely helpful, which may need caregiver facilitated play dates and may need caregiver facilitated school interactions, just like we might see needing facilitated play dates or school interactions at the beginning of a school year or with a new cohort of kids. But the internet can be your friend. There are tons of games and activities that you can play together and screen share them. So I just put a couple of lists here. I've been using National Geographic Kids. That's a website where there are a lot of quizzes that you can share on the screen. And you can actually often very, um, it's usually very easy to figure out how to use a screen sharing function on 
Zoom or other video platforms where it just allows you to show your screen to the other person. So there are coloring and puzzle games on Disney and Nick Jr. Certainly, um, I've been doing a lot of spot the difference with some older kids. It's like pretty difficult pictures where you have to pick out the same, um, the same picture on both sides, but you have to see the differences from one picture to another. You, there are a lot of games that are common board games that you can actually do over the internet. And then of course, just creative things like I'm thinking of an animal that lives on a farm. So sort of 20 questions kinds of things. In our slides here, and I believe the slides will be available, this is a step-by-step -step how to do a fade-in using phys physical distance from a screen. So this is pretty similar to an in-person fade-in and really doesn't require a lot of manipulation of technology. I'm not gonna go through each step, but I know we're gonna have the slides available so you'll be able to look at all these steps. So for school planning, it's hard to, to identify the top items to do at school because everybody's school situation is different. And some people have started school already, some people haven't. And so it really, it requires a lot of specific information that's going to be very specific to your child. What I will say is the first question you wanna ask yourself is what's the current plan and the plan for the next 30 days? The reason I ask that is that what you do is probably dependent on what's happening now and in the next month or so. So like, are we hybrid? Are we fully remote? Are we fully in person? Knowing the answer to that question is going to help decide what do we do? It's helpful to know, of course, has my child ever spoken in the place that they're going to be? In the building, are they changing buildings? Do we have a 504 IEP in place? If you already do, I would definitely recommend that you reach out to your 504 or IEP coordinator and set up a time to talk because even if your child has a plan that was great eight months ago, it might need some tweaks or modifications, especially, excuse me, especially if you're in a hybrid or fully remote plan. Or your question might be, does the school know about my child's SM and how can I help them get some information about SM. And I would direct you to our website, the Selective Mutism Association, for some really great handouts on SM. And then where in treatment or intervention are we? Have we been working with someone, um, a treatment provider who specializes in SM, and where are we in the treatment process? Those are some initial questions. Whether you're virtual or in person, you really need to know where your child was in terms of speaking prior to the pandemic right? Because speaking um, is going to be different for every child, and you're likely going to want to go to the last place of success and build from there. So whether that means that um, you're going to be in person, and your child would have met their new teacher for next year, but during the pandemic, you weren't able to do that, probably the first thing you're going to want to do is plan for a time to chat with school and have your child have a fade in with their new teacher. Similarly, if your child um, has not ever spoken in school and you were in the beginning of treatment and you're going to be virtual, you still probably want to have a conversation with school, but your goals for fade-ins and exposures are likely going to be very different. And pace of this plan is going to depend on a variety of factors. You may consider um, applying for a 504 IEP. I think oftentimes, given the current situation with schools and just the demands in terms of the pandemic, it may be that requesting a 504 might be a faster process in order to put your child on the map, so to speak. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't pursue an IEP if you need to or if you are going to, but just know that if kids are remote and an IEP requires evaluation and testing, that might really push out the, the timeline. So you might want to regroup and figure out what would be the best plan to pursue if you don't have one. Regardless of if the school is in person or virtual, fade-ins require patience and planning and some reinforcement, both of the child and staff. So meaning labeled praise and reinforcement goes a long way. So saying to the school, I know how hard you guys are working. Thank you so much for making some time for us. Um, this is gonna be so helpful to front load um, the, the year and just make things more successful for Benjamin. 
So you really want to think about prioritizing who you should start with. Often you want to start a fade in with the teacher, but given that the demands on the teacher may be split in a variety of ways, it might make sense to prioritize starting with a teaching assistant or a school psychologist or a speech language pathologist. And so likely a fade in will need to happen more than once. And you want to go back to the fade in process and how you test if it's six. Um, and you want to figure out if you need your treatment team to help. So I would say if you have a treatment provider, I think that it's very advantageous to have the treatment provider help facilitate fade-ins, whether it's by consulting to the school and giving them information, or if it's actually helping with the fade-in process. And a good thing to think about is, while of course we would love to have hour-long fade-ins if we could, asking for 10 to 15 minutes of individual time to start with might be a really great place to start. Other ways you can help your child when you're virtual. So I just put on two sides of the slide. If your child is not yet verbal, one of the things you could be doing is helping your child practice being on camera or typing comments if they're at an age where they can type. So maybe just being on camera is a good place to start. You would want to schedule some fade-ins with the teacher and other staff and request to visit the school to practice speaking there if it's going to be at all a hybrid and outside works also so even just coming onto the school grounds with your child alone to practice talking you can have virtual play dates with peers that are in the class you could consider sending in recordings of your child reading or even just verbalizing with you so that the school can see your child speaking and you want to really think about how you're going to use reinforcement with your child to progress towards these goals if your child is already verbal to any extent, you want to have your child practice being on camera with the audio on, even if they're not even yet answering. You want to get some one-to-one -one time with the teacher to ensure that he or she is verbal. So maybe you don't actually need a fade-in. Maybe your child is minimally verbal in one-to-one -one situation. And so maybe you need a little bit of time with the teacher to make sure that they're a little bit verbal, even just with them alone. And then you want to plan together for some appropriate goals, whether it's answering two questions per class or just working on raising hand with no expectation to speak or identifying times that the teacher will work with in a small group with your child maybe with two peers your child's already familiar with maybe if your child is working on some of these goals and they're at an age where they can read a sticky note you can put their goals right on the computer if they're virtual that just reminds them that every time they answer a question they're going to get a check mark and going back to that reinforcement. So let's kind of put this all together as we wrap up. Remember that this is a marathon and not a sprint. Even if your child, um, even absent of the pandemic, this is a marathon and not a sprint. SM treatment often is, like any other anxiety treatment, is a process and the process of transferring speech and supporting speech-related goals is a process. So. SM is a treatable anxiety disorder, and there's evidence to support behavioral treatment and PCIT-SM is one of those treatments. Using CDI and VDI is going to help with verbalization, so practicing that is helpful. Fade-ins can be done in person or virtually, and exposures are key. And so again, you can do exposures even if you're socially distant right now. If you are going to a drive through but not going in a store, you can have your child come with you in the car. If you're socially distancing at a park, you can practice having your child speak to you at the park. These are all great exposures. Telehealth is a good option during a time when face-to-face -face therapy is not possible, and accommodations in school can be adjusted for the virtual format. Practice, practice, practice is the most important thing. And on the last slide, I'm just going to direct you to the Selective, Selective Mutism Association, also to our YouTube channel, which is Selective Mutism Association as well, and also to the SM Learning University. It's free and teaches you amazing skills. So you can definitely write this down or click on that link so that you can start practicing even today. Thank you so much for joining me. I really hope that this uh, webinar was helpful and that you can watch it and share it with other people. You can certainly share it with schools if you like, and I hope that you stay safe and be well.